Welcome, good evening. Uh, this is episode number two of season three of the Late Night Conference. Uh, uh, my name is Wilhelm Huck and I'm your host tonight. Very nice to see you. Very nice for the, those of you uh, to, uh, to watch online. Welcome as well. Uh, and as you know, in this third season, we are discussing chemistry and AI. And tonight's speaker is really doing exactly that. He is doing chemistry and AI. Last week, you remember, we, gave, we got a first introduction of what AI can do for you. The thing that most struck me was this uh, sort of diffusion-based model where you started with a picture of a church and then you had complete noise and then you went back and you had a picture of a new church that didn't exist but definitely looked. Today, we're sort of really going to talk about molecules because my guest uh, tonight is assistant professor from Groningen, uh, Dr. Robert Politsche. He, welcome here tonight. Um, Robert is an organic chemist, trained in Vienna, he did his undergraduate studies there, and did a PhD at the ETH in Zurich, working with Peter Chan, so that is much more physical chemistry, mass spectrometry, um, sort of fundamentals of interactions between molecules. And after that, he decided to change topic a little bit. He went to the lab of Alan aspuru gusek at the University of Toronto, who is really one of the gurus um, uh, of artificial intelligence and chemistry. I think in the context of our soon-to-be robot lab, he's also one of our big competitors because he definitely is very interested in building a self-driving lab in robot, uh, sorry, in Toronto. Uh, and we will see how our robot lab uh, will compare their self-driving lab in the future. Um, but as I said tonight, it's uh, Robert who will discuss uh, his work uh, that he is going to work on. He was uh, sort of hired as a faculty member at the University of Groningen. Just started there in October, so he's really unpacking boxes and setting up his lab. And we are looking forward uh, to what he is going to teach us tonight. So, um, for those of you watching online, uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we can discuss them later on. For everyone else, there will be plenty of time to do, sort of ask questions after the lecture. Um, and with that, uh, I would like Robert to stand up and get things going for tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this great introduction. It's really great to be here in this wonderful audience uh, and give you a, a brief or a brief overview of what I actually call artificial organic chemistry. So what we are trying to do is a combination of several topics. So let's say the target application that we want to aim at is molecular catalysis. And maybe for that, let's say, general science audience that's not too familiar what catalysis is, just think about your car, where you have a, car, a catalytic converter that converts, let's say, NOx to nitrogen and, and things like this. So catalysts really can enable clean technologies. They can uh, enable new transformations. Uh, and what we're looking at is into uh, designing catalysts. And for that, we want to use new technologies. Uh, and one of the things that we're aided by is simulation technologies. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Moore's law that basically can predict roughly the increase of computational speed. Uh, but it, and it means for chemistry that every, every year we can access ever larger, ever more complex systems and that we really want to benefit from. And this, uh, I think, fuses very well together with the new capabilities in lab automation and what I call artificial design, in a sense, using artificial intelligence to design structures. And I think the combination of these topics is really what I define as artificial organic chemistry. So we have uh, parts that are more based on organic chemistries so or organic molecules. We do reactions, study their interactions, and we use lab automation and uh, programming and AI uh, to, to combine it to, let's say, really define a new field uh, or a new subfield of organic chemistry. But what I want to do today is actually look a bit closer in only one of these four pillars, and that's the artificial design bit. So what does it mean? What, what does artificial design mean? Uh, so I think if you, if you look into the history of design, uh, if you think of how likely people came up with a wheel, probably it happened in the way that first there was structure or shape, 
So maybe the trunk of a tree that could roll. And then people realized that, well, I could basically attach this to a cart and use it to transport objects or transport people. Uh, so it was this paradigm of I have first a structure, a shape, and based on that, I get inspired and devise a function for it. And that's actually also how classically in, in chemistry design was, was done or was thought of. So you start with a structure, you have a molecule, you know its structure, and you study the properties of S. And once you know the property, you, you get inspired by those properties and devise a function for them. So first structure, then function. That's the direct design approach. The idea of the inverse design is really reversing the paradigm. I don't want to think about structure first. I want to think about the property first. So uh, I want to get a molecule with a certain property. And actually, I do not care as much what the molecule looks like as long as it fulfills all the properties I needed to have. And that's really what AI can do. Um, and for, let's say, if, if you can imagine, if you have a hard time imagining this, think about as a very high dimensional space where you wanna, let's say, climb a mountain. But the thing is, you, you need to climb the mountain without being able to see to the summit uh, and to actually make it even more complicated, I think the better analogy is to think of it as a volcano, because there are also like these pits or these these areas of of lava where you actually cannot walk. That's very, I think that's very analogous to chemistry, where if you cannot make a, a con you cannot walk the con property, there might not be a molecule in that hole of of chemistry. So. Uh, and that's just the, basically the lava that you cannot enter, but you still have to somehow climb the mountain. Uh, so, the, so one uh, thing to do this is getting inspired by nature. How does nature solve uh, these problems? And one algorithm that's very powerful is obviously the Darwinian evolution. And what is inspired by Darwinian evolution is genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithms have existed for a very, uh, quite a long time in computer science. And they're iterative optimization algorithms that uh, basically rely on a population of candidate solutions. So very, think of, for instance, in, in evolution, you have a population of species. You now have a population, for instance, of molecules or a population of objects with all distinct features. And you basically try to see uh, which, one, which members of the population fulfill the properties and in addition to that, you not only need the algorithm and the population, but you need a way to, let's say, have the population interact with each other or have a way of creating new population members with new features that none of the initial population members had. These are the genetic operations. So the workflow usually works like this for molecules. You start with an initial population of candidate molecules, and they all uh, have certain properties, uh, that some that you want and some that you don't. And if you define now a target property in a very well-defined way, you can basically rank uh, all the population members with respect to their fitness. Uh, and the most fit ones are those that you probably want to select. And so similar how we imagine natural selection to work, those can then be used to create new combinations of molecules of candidate solutions that might now be even better suited to solve the problem that you want. And if you iterate, it, iter iterate the cycle just en uh, enough times, uh, at least based on what we see from nature, you, you many times end up with uh, solutions to a problem or let's say to a design space uh, that is superior to everything that has seen before. And that's really the idea. So coming back to how can you implement this? The key uh, component is uh, defining these genetic operations and representing your structures. Uh, because sure, you can have a population of molecules, but if I don't know how to create new structures, I cannot you know, enter this cycle, this optimization loop. Uh, and the two operations that are used in nature are mutation, which is small random changes in features of the uh, population members, and crossover, so exchange of, of traits, of features between population members. And the key question is now, how can you implement these on a computer? And I think one of the 
let's say, more obvious ways to do is if thinking about so-called string representation. For those of you that are not too familiar with computer science, a string is just a sequence of characters. Just as here, the word string is itself a string. Um, and in, in molecules, uh, you can actually represent a molecular graph that is a graph that represents a molecule or an organic structure into such a sequence of characters. And the most common one is smiles. So what you can see here to the left is the molecular graph of, of a simple organic molecule, benzene, very well known, uh, very stable, uh, very interesting properties. Uh, and it's now converted into this sequence of characters that encodes the structure in, in a, let's say, a way that's very easy to handle by the computer. Uh, and I wanna walk you through how this smiles works a bit to really uh, understand, help you understand this representation at all. So I if I start the sequence from left to right, uh, I, have, I look at the first two characters here. Uh, the ones in red really represent the first double bond of benzene. The character one we will ignore for a bit, but we will look, we will look at it at the end again. And now I really start walking like in a linear chain around the cycle. So I add the next single bond to a carbon, so I just add another C. Now I will do another double bond uh, to another carbon. I'll do another single bond, another double bond. So I have these alternating double bonds say in this uh, one way of representing uh, uh, benzene. And then I need to close the cycle. And that's where actually I come back to the, the number one. Because in SMILES, what is needed is once you open a cycle with a number, you'd always need to close it. So imagine if I make a, a small random change to this representation and I remove the character one at the end. It means that the computer thinks there is a cycle, but it doesn't terminate it. It doesn't close the cycle ever. So the computer will think, I'm not done, the molecule is not yet complete, so I cannot proceed. So that means it can, this representation is relatively easy to break. And that's actually, let's say, one of the drawbacks of SMILES when working uh, with it as a computer representation. It has a, a complex syntax in a sense that you need to obey very strict rules, and if you don't obey them, it's meaningless. And that's why recently we, there is this idea of having selfies as a 100% robust representation. So you, you see it's a bit, it looks a bit more complicated. Don't get too confused by the brackets. Basically every bracket just means the content of this is, is regarded as one character, even though it might be several characters. Uh, but you could replace it with just a single character. It's more like for reality. But what the, this representation gives you is the following. If I start with benzene, and make any random modifications to it, I will always get a molecule. So I can modify one character, I can, for instance, get pyridine. I can remove a character, I can now get a, a cyclopentadiene, or if I add a character, I get phenol. And I, in that sense, I can do any random transformation and it will not break the representation. It's always a molecule. And if you think about it, this is exactly what we need for a, a mutation in a genetic algorithm. But more than that, not only mutation, there is also an easy way to do something like a crossover. So if we have these two molecules and the two selfies representations, if you now basically go one by one to this representation and compare the two and just randomly match them, like for instance here, this, I change this now to this, and then I do the next, I change this to this, and so on and so forth, I basically, like basically transform the initial structure in what it would seemingly, uh, let's say, a natural progression that's more closely resembling the target structure. And you can really think of this as an exchange of, of genes, of features. Uh, so it's really uh, this crossover operation that you need. So this selfies really allows you to naturally implement this. In and we did this in the algorithm that's uh, called Chanus. And Chanus has a couple of interesting features for chemistry optimization. So not only does it use selfies, so we use the selfies to do this mutation and crossover, but also it actually uh, propagates not one but two populations. And this is really inspired by this, um, let's say, balance between exploration and exploitation. So like usually when you optimize a high dimensional space, what you want to do is you want to, um, to some extent, 
uh, explore, um, let's say, the entirety of the landscape to, to get all the maxima and minima. Uh, but on the other hand, if you are close to a very good solution, you obviously want to get to the actual uh, best value. So that's the exploitation bit. And the idea is that the algorithm kind of like does both at the same time and in that way efficiently explores these property landscape. And to do that efficiently, you need some way of connecting the two uh, that you can exchange members between the two and let's say use solutions from the exploitation component to then maybe uh, exchange with the exploration and do some more exploration with those solutions again and so on and so forth. So the idea is really to have a balance between this exploitation and export. And actually one other thing that it has, it, it makes use of a neural network that continuously learns a, a simple structure property relationship. So in a sense, uh, the algorithm learns if you give it uh, the, the selfies of a structure, uh, whether this will be uh, the molecule that you want or not. And by that can really quickly navigate through the space uh, and basically uh, deliver, let's say, the, the molecule with the desired property. So two special features of the algorithm, nice. Um, but there is another thing, whenever you come up um, with an algorithm like this, because it's, this is obviously not the only one, there are several out there, you always want to know how good it does. And in computer science, there is this entire field of benchmarking that only in some, uh, sub, in some fields of chemistry, particularly I think in computational chemistry, are, are well appreciated. Uh, so what does it mean? So a benchmark, if you actually want to know where the word comes from, it's actually these markings in a stone that were used to, to set up a, a measuring uh, device of land surveyors. And however, what it actually means in, in the sense of computer science is you you want to assess the performance of a computer program on a well-defined task. So you could really think of this as uh, I have a problem and this problem is always going to be the same and I want to run several algorithms that solve the same problem for me and I'm going to see which one does it in the best way, which one does it in the fastest way uh, and so on. And by that you learn which algorithm you, you can probably use for what you're interested in. So the idea is, is, I would say, threefold. Obviously, one is model selection. Uh, so you want to use a benchmarking to select the algorithm. However, there is another component. Um, usually, in, let's say, in chemistry, we have very complex design challenges that are actual, let's say, more long-term goal. But those might be hard to reach or, let's say, expensive to measure. And if I now pick now at random an algorithm to, to solve this problem, it, I might just by chance pick the one that's worst at it. And by that spend a lot of money on additional experiments, additional simulations that I wouldn't have needed. So what I want my benchmark to be, it needs to be more affordable than let's say the actual problem that I want to solve because otherwise I can just solve the problem I have. Uh, so if I want to select a model for a challenge or for a, uh, uh, a property optimization. I, I pick a benchmark that kind of resembles that problem, but is somewhat, let's say, simpler, easier to do, select the model. And the third thing, yeah, that I already mentioned that, you want it to be relevant. Uh, and I give you a couple of examples from computer science and AI to, to get you an idea of why this is important. So ImageNet, uh, some of you might have heard of this, it's both a data set and a, a challenge data set of images created by photographers and the task and it's an, an annotated database of pictures with the objects defined therein. So for instance, you have a picture of a cat, uh, there, is an, there it says these pixels represent a cat or this is a car or whatever you can think of. And in, in total right now, there are like 14 million images database. And this, op, this challenge actually by now it's kind of outdated, but until 2017 was one of the most important uh, benchmarks for visual object recognition. So if you think of self-driving cars, this is exactly the data set that you need. It might not be uh, as complicated as the actual final application of computer vision, but it resembles many of the challenges. Because in, if you have a self-driving car, let's say in a, in a, in a busy street, you have maybe to have, uh, have many of these object classification tasks that you need to do. 
And if you test your algorithm on a simpler data set, you can probably learn which ones are most likely to also perform in the car. Um, and the other one that maybe more, let's say, the natural science will find interesting is AlphaFold. So it basically, AlphaFold could only uh, be generated because there was this challenge of protein structure prediction, the CASP challenge, that was running since 1994 already. And they, had, they, they relied on a, a very well curated database, the Protein Data Bank, over 200,000 structures, uh, full structures of protein. And the idea of the task is you're given an amino acid sequence and you want a model that gives you, let's say, the three-dimensional structure of the protein. So tertiary, quarter, 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 quaternary structure. And these are actually, this is actually an example from the AlphaFold paper where they kind of overlay the prediction with experimental structure. You can really see that uh, for, for large parts of the protein, the algorithm is, is very much spot on. It's not perfect, but also the experiment is not perfect. And it has been argued that it's, the algorithm is as good as we can hope it to be based on the quality of the data set. So if you think of this, what would be needed for inverse design of molecules? And when we, when we were finished with Chanus and used it on the existing benchmarks, we were, we were kind of, we thought like, are these benchmarks really meaningful for what we want to do? So we thought, okay, so we can use this benchmark model selection, they're affordable, but do they really provide relevant information? Um, so we, what, we th what we said, we thought no. And with that, we actually then entered another project uh, to kind of define or let's say redefine the benchmarking landscapes of inverse molecular design. So what we wanted to do is uh, find relevant problems in the literature of chemistry, of organic chemistry, of materials chemistry, but let's say find a simple version of it that still uh, provides useful information, but that we can solve in a reasonable amount of time so people can test the algorithm on the computer. And that's when we uh, came up with Tartarus. So the reason we decided to name this Tartarus is really if you think what Tartarus in, in Greek mythology is. It's a place where souls are judged after death and the wicked receive divine punishment. So if you think of with all these AI models, many of them may be underperforming, they are really judged for their performance. So we thought this is really uh, a fitting name for this. Um, so the overall workflow uh, in an abstract sense is relatively simple. So what we need to provide is a data set for a given benchmark. So it's basically a set of molecules with property. We need to say, okay, this is our target property. And then we need to have a, a simulation workflow that simulates this target property. This simulation workflow needs to, let's say, at least if you do experiments later on, correlate with the, the property you want to do. Uh, but the reason why we went for simulation is because obviously then even uh, computer scientists can use our models without requiring access to lab. I mean, maybe in the future with a robot lab, this might actually be not so hard to think of that even people outside chemistry to a chemistry lab. But let's say at least in the near future, it, they, they already have access to computer clusters. So that's the more obvious step. Uh, and the idea is they would only need to plug in their molecular design algorithm. And so this bit is kind of replaceable with whatever you want to have. And then uh, the molecular design algorithm suggests molecules, uh, the simulation workflow simulates them, gives big properties, and you can start this cycle of inverse design and optimize properties. So if this is already too abstract, I, I really like the analogy with thinking of it in terms of video games. Let's imagine I'm a video game player and I play Tetris. So now, uh, as you, I'm pretty sure most of you know, Tetris, uh, let's say it's, it's a simple game where you need to uh, place blocks in this dimensional landscape, but to get very good at it and to get very high uh, scores on it is actually a, not a trivial topic. And I actually just learned, I think two weeks ago, at the University of Groningen, I have an, a colleague in, in the AI department that basically works on that problem of having computers play Tetris and finding better algorithms to solve Tetris. Um, so they have a high score board and whatever algorithm you have, you can be the top, uh, but you can also be on the bottom. 
but the idea is that you let the algorithm play this game in the chemistry space is this simulation game where you simulate a property that resembles the experimental property and you learn, the computer learns how to get better at playing this game. Um, and after a while you collect this game data and uh, like if you have a benchmark you can just provide it for people to learn on but maybe you can also use it to design already useful properties. I mean I don't know if it's useful for Tetris but for uh, organic molecules uh, that might make a difference. And with that I'm already uh, the, nearing the end. So the real uh, idea is to, of Tartarus is to provide benchmarks that solve this inverse design problem and that we can find, uh, either identify problems in the existing algorithms, if the, assess new algorithms and really push the field forward. Uh, so I will just uh, finish by thanking a lot of great group, uh, people that worked with me on, on all these problems on Tartarus, on, on Janus, on selfies and on, on uh, implementing uh, the genetic algorithm. Uh, uh, DARPA, SNF, and NSERC for funding, and finally you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to all the questions you might have about this. Uh, thank you very much. Robert, thank you. That was a really very nice overview because I think you started with the inverse design, and I think that's where I think AI for the chemist is going to make the biggest impact. Because I think for the past hundred years we have, of course, look at the structure of a molecule and thought, what can we do with it? How can we do a reaction, etc. We haven't really said, we want this molecule, let the computer come up with a way of synthesizing it. So I do that, but then I will ask you or Eva to actually make it for me, but that's not quite the same, right? So, uh, so I really like that. And then I think the other thing that I really like is that you sort of explain very carefully is where this computer language and our language uh, of chemistry come together. So the, translation of the 2D molecular structure that we draw and the selfies or the smiles that you can write in the computer can understand. I think that is the, definitely the take home message today on how you do that. Um, my first question actually was, I can definitely see why the computer now speaks our language in terms of when I talk about benzene, the computer also has a picture of benzene. Um, but how does the computer now know what the properties of benzene are? So uh, how do you sort of couple the function of a molecule to the actual SMILES representation? How do you sort of go to some kind of learning algorithm to couple properties of molecules with the structure of them? Yeah, so exactly. It's, uh, I think that's really the key of this uh, of field. So what you usually do in AI, so obviously the, the SMILES or self is say the input representation. But then um, what the computer does is, so you set up, let's say, if you have a neural network, you have all these layers with the neurons and, and the layer as its kind of set of parameters. Uh, and so, so what the computer actually learns is it kind of learns a different representation. So it actually, I think in the AI literature is often also just um, used in the context of representation learning. So in a way, once, you, if you have, a, let's say, input smiles and then your data set with a lot of properties, and then in the, between this black box with this AI model, what the computer does, it's basically, it kind of transforms the smiles representation, or um, sometimes the smiles is actually also not exactly the input representation, but right for now. So it translates this representation into this higher dimensional space of this, um, and let's say of these hidden layers in the neural network. And that is then where the actual, let's say interesting bit comes in, the structure property re relationship is uh, encoded, if you will. So yeah, I think that's how I would think about it. Um, Can you give an indication on how big the databases currently are train these kind of neural networks to sort of actually correlate the smiles with molecular properties? So yeah, I mean that it's it's that's in, that's an interesting question because it's actually pretty heterogeneous. So for instance, uh, one uh, package that's used at Contact kind of become standard if you just want to start a plug and play with AI for molecules is DeepChem, and there they pick a lot of data sets from tasks that are related to practice, and there for some of the tasks they 
they might have something a little bit short of thousand molecules or so, up to tens of thousands, but not much larger than that because it becomes um, the harder uh, to get the actual. If you go to larger data sets, then usually they will look into simulated properties. Uh, like for instance, um, there's this uh, QM9 data set, and there is like DB data sets that are, um, you can get to let's say millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions, but that's then becoming rare. But so I think there is a whole spectrum of data set sizes, and in all of these, um, there have been demonstrations that AI architecture Meaningful. Well, yeah, I would see. Any more questions? But I'm looking around whether somebody in the audience has it. Evan. You go first and then. Thank you very much, Rob. This is very eye-opening. Uh, I have a related question to Wilhelm's um, about about the data the data set. For example, I, you know, like I'm interested in redox properties of an organic molecule. But the redox property of organic molecule out there may, let's say, have a hundred or two hundred. Doesn't give us a, a big data set at this point. Is there a way, from a computational point of view, to to accelerate or maybe just collect some somehow train this limited amount of data and get the property out. Yeah, I think I think you're raising I I think pretty much the question that many chemists or physicists scientists in general uh, like ask like how like they know they have a certain limitation in terms of the data but they would like to do more. So one thing that I think is most effective in that respect. Uh, and I think you mentioned it actually, uh, is to combine using experimental and computational data. And I think the key is making sure that your simulated properties have a relationship with your experimental properties. I think it's pretty much the similar idea to what I mentioned with these benchmarks. If you have, let's say, let's say you have, uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred molecules and you know there may be redox potential or I don't know what you're looking at. But let's assume now that for these uh, few hundred molecules, you have a computational protocol that let's say on a single laptop within maybe one or two hours can predict uh, the, this property. And you know that over the 300 molecules, uh, there is a relationship between. It doesn't need to be a perfect correspondence. It doesn't need to be an, a perfect predictor, but you know there is a, a, a meaningful correlation between those two. And basically what you can do is you can use uh, training approaches where you generate thousands, ten thousands of simulated data points, uh, train your an AI model on that, and then uh, fine tune the model on the 300 experimental points. And by that, having a model that knows much more about the, the structure property relationship than if you just trained it on the experimental data. And I think this is, um, at least for the near future, this is, I think, the way to go. It might be that in the, let's say, for the future, also thinking about the robot lab, that we want to actually go to increasing the throughput of experiments and thinking of clever ways of doing the same experiments. But it's certainly, you can right now go to your laptop and simulate these properties. And if you make sure there is a relationship, you can do that. And that's, I think, the way forward. And that's actually, I think, what also several people have done. I mean, I don't know specifically for uh, redox potential of batteries, but I'm pretty sure this has been uh, tackled. So, yeah. But if I imagine, if I may, if you think about redox properties or homo lumo, uh, so fluorescence properties or band gaps, then I can imagine that you can simulate the data because it is related to the electronic structure. So, so I guess you can simulate your data, but what do you do if you want to predict solubility of molecules? Because Yes, you can predict that partially as well, I, I suppose, but it becomes much harder, right? Because there it's not such an easy correlation between just the molecular structure. You think about calculating the enthalpy of solvation and all these things, much harder. Uh, would you still simulate or how would you go about doing that? 
I mean, I personally, because I, I have actually done solubility, uh, let's say calculations with Cosmo RS, I would at least try it uh, because it's, it's relatively fast. So it, it would fulfill this requirement that let's say in one or two hours for reasonably small okay. molecules, you can do it on your own laptop. So that, that, it, that's like criteria it will fulfill. I would try it. Um, but I mean, what actually have many people done is, uh, is let's say a more classical approach that they um, don't simulate the actual properties, but they look into, let's say, um, descriptors that are known based on, let's say, a lot of like scientific study in the past decades to correlate or let's say have a relationship with these properties. Because uh, I mean, yeah, like, as you say, like solubility, uh, it's, I think, at least, I think, at least for also for humans, it's very hard to predict it. And so you want to have simple, like, let's say, handles to understand it. And that's like a lot of scientific work has gone into this. So I, I, I would start there. Like, if I cannot simulate it, uh, I'm pretty sure that somebody looked into simple ways of correlating it to something else and then used that. Uh, because I, I mean, pretty much a lot of physical organic chemistry has been that. So, yeah, that's what I would do. There was another question earlier, I think. Dimitra? You were walking towards somebody, I thought. Yes. Just curious, I don't know whether it is a stupid question, but how are the models performing with the idea which you mentioned? Right? So, um, if you have any information about it, though. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so we, we ran, uh, for instance, Genus on all the existing invert or almost all the existing inverse design benchmarks. And for the ones that we did, it was either top performing or almost top performing. Um, but we also weren't really happy with that because we, we thought um, that the benchmark doesn't tell us much. And that's why we actually and then went into this new benchmark platform. So I didn't spend too much time there, but so maybe I, I elaborate a bit here. So we decided to go for four specific target applications. So we have one on organic light emitting diodes. Most of the, one of the obvious reasons for doing that is because we had worked a lot on this in the group. So we had a lot of experience simulating and designing uh, organic light emitting diodes. We have one benchmark on um, organic photovoltaics for the same reason. Alan's group has done that for many years. Uh, if you think Harvard Clean Energy Project, there's also a data set that exists. Uh, one of them was uh, molecular docking on, 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 on proteins, which is a task that's, that's pretty much studied up and down in pharmacy or in biochemistry, uh, not, yeah, pharmaceutical chemistry. And uh, there are well, there are easy, simple programs to do it. It's, it's, let's say, you just put it in your workflow and it works. Um, and the fourth problem was actually um, reactivity of, of, of substrates with respect to um, a pericyclic reaction. Uh, so those were the first four tasks that we chose. And in those, it was actually interesting that we found we couldn't identify one model that was best. So we used Genus, we used, uh, for instance, um, uh, a reinforcement learning approach, we used variational autoencoder. Uh, so we used different types of algorithms that are there. And we couldn't find one algorithm that across all these four domain spaces was the best. And for us, it was actually, if you, you might find it, maybe you might find it weird, but we found this the most exciting bit because it told us Whereas the initial benchmarks we did before told us ours was the best, the new benchmarks told us, no, it's not. And that I thought was actually the progress for the field. So for instance, um, I think for the organic light emitting diodes task, it was not, Janus was not the best, but it was the best on uh, designing substrates that are reactive for this uh, pericyclic reaction. So, and right now we're actually still kind of trying to understand why that is the case. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, uh, it's, it's a good question. And I think uh, you really, it's, it makes you start to think about what are the metrics that you use to evaluate how good your algorithm is. And I think that really is something what, what is key to be able to choose your algorithm. 
think there was another question, and then Bob, uh, Bob first, and Oscar, I think. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. I also had a question about the benchmarking. So the way I understand it is the scoring function, basically, that you set shapes the fitness landscape, right? And the model selection that you have is the search pattern you apply to, to, to screen that landscape until you find some sort of optimum. So doesn't it make sense that different problems have different algorithms that perform better because it just shapes the landscape differently? No, exactly. I, I, perfect. I think you made a perfect analysis of the problem. Um, but you, you could imagine a situation where you have one algorithm that is so powerful that it can adapt how it shapes these landscapes to the problem that you want, right? So you could, let's say the, the perfect, in a perfect world, we have this algorithm that always explores the space in exactly the way the problem spa uh, shapes the space in. So, so the algorithm that adapts to the problem and it, but it doesn't know that until it starts exploring a space. So no, but it, it updates its. No, so the thing is, yeah, okay. So one thing I, I didn't mention maybe too much is there is an initial training involved. Um, so we provide a data set where we ran the simulation workflow and let's say thousands, tens of thousands of molecules. So we have structures with their properties. And these are provided before this loop is started and the algorithm can learn from this uh, to adapt. And, that, and in, this is in part, we wouldn't need this for our genetic algorithm because our genetic algorithm can start from random but you need it for some of the other algorithms that, that function a different way, where they first shape the space and then explore. Uh, like for instance, if you have a variational autoencode, in principle, it is possible to train it on the fly, but it would be a very long, it would take quite some time until it gets to a point where it understands the high dimensional space and actually gets to not doing random search. So that's why, so yeah, so in that sense, there is something the algorithm can learn even though it hasn't entered the loop. Thank you very much. Thank you. So my question is also related to this space of possibilities that you can create starting from one structure using these uh, two genetic tools. I don't know exactly how, how you have fra framed them. So one is mutation and the other uh, would be similar to what happens in the process of recombination. Uh, so my question is from the molecular point of view, do you think it's, so recombination uh, in biology doesn't happen at random. So there are, um, it happens because genes are self-contained functioning structures that then you can interchange uh, in a longer chain of DNA. So do you think this is relevant for molecules in the sense that there are chemical modules that maybe you would be interested in enforcing before you ask recombination to happen? Or do you think it's more beneficial to do it completely at random? I don't know if this is actually relevant. But no, just thank, you, thank you very much for your question. I think you have a, like, I, I have to say, I mean, I, I, I don't know biology that much, so I don't know this fine details, you seem to be much more skilled than I in that respect. But I think you actually have a great idea for a new algorithm. So if you want to work with me on this, I'm happy to work <laughs> with you. But I, but I think to, to, to generally put this idea, like I think we can get inspired a lot by how nature does things. So I, I do think there could be a more efficient way of, exp of solving certain problems if you don't use these isolated features, but maybe this, I don't know exactly, but you call this like more genes that are kind of related and they're exchanged together. So I think it could actually be a more efficient way of, of generating new structures. So I think I, I like the idea a lot and I think uh, this might actually well be a way to getting a, an alternative algorithm that it performs even better. So yeah, maybe you want to explore that. Thank you. What a question. I think to bring the discussion a little bit back to chemistry rather than too much biology. <laughs> um, because you've now mostly talked about the properties of molecules, but of course, chemists want to make new molecules, right? So you have to do chemical reactions. Uh, 
And then I think it's not difficult to write down a chemical reaction on a piece of paper and draw your curly arrows and look in the literature to find some reagents that will do the job. And then when you do it, it doesn't work. Because, well, or it doesn't work as well as you had hoped because either the reaction needed a different temperature or a different solvent or there are side products. And so how do you see sort of the impact of AI in the next step is to, in a way, maybe improve the sort of quality of the reactions that you're going to do or the experiments? That is this something that you think we are close to making breakthroughs already? So, yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I think there are multiple aspects to it. I mean, if you, there have been several studies recently where they tried to basically do exactly that, but uh, kind of either take data sets from patents or take data sets from uh, the chemistry literature that are cu from curated databases where let's say you have a typical reaction scheme, right? Like you have a couple of substrates, you have conditions. So they don't really learn the experimental procedure, but they learn, let's say, a very simplified version of it, uh, or they know that. And then um, they use this to either learn, uh, like what substrates should I use for this with this catalyst? Um, what conditions should I use to run this reaction? And it seemed that uh, it, some of these work uh, quite okay, uh, like some of these approaches, but others actually failed miserably. And the question is why that is. I mean, one one question you could like one question you could ask is, is it the the data? Is the data quality not good enough, or is the data representation not good? Enough? I mean, uh, maybe the data is actually fine, but just drawing this nice reaction scheme is just not providing all the fine details of how the experiment was done. So in that sense, I think, um, I definitely think AI can make, it, can make a, an impact, but I think we need to change the way that we represent, um, let's say, these experiments. So personally, I think I, it would be ideal to probably feed the computer the actual experimental procedure, but then in a standardized way. So you could actually think of, uh, defining a synthesis procedure as kind of a, a, an algorithm, right? Like step A, dissolving components, step B, mixing components, and things like this. Like an abstraction of the, 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 the reaction. Um, and, but, okay, this is one thing. But there is another thing where actually AI can help you immediately, and that is if you, let's say, want to optimize reaction conditions. So let's say you have an experimental uh, setup, you have your substrates, and you want to let's say, optimize temperature, optimize concentration, optimize maybe you have a set of catalysts. And then you can use uh, something like Bayesian optimization. Uh, and that has actually been shown already several times to successfully deliver uh, optimal reaction conditions, sometimes maybe even reaction conditions that would not have been probably likely be found by, let's say, human experiment that just because of an unusual combination, or let's say they realized that that the reactivity is very dependent on temperature, so they chose, if you can control temperature finally, you can also do single degree or two degree steps that you wouldn't do as a normal person in the lab. Uh, so in that sense, I think there it can have an immediate impact. For the, let's say, larger picture of understanding reactivity, in principle, yes, but if you directly want to translate it to the lab, I think there is still some ways to go, and I think there is also a role for us uh, chemists uh, to think about the right way of representing the data uh, in a way that the computer understands fine details and it's not just compound A plus compound B gives compound C. Yeah, it's not as simple as that as we know if we went into the lab, right? So maybe a more personal question because it looks like AI is definitely transforming the way we're doing chemistry and we can talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, it's also quite a big step, I can imagine, sort of transforming yourself from somebody who works more in the traditional way of doing chemistry to a much more AI-based approach. And what is your sort of suggestion for people who might be interested in doing this? Is this a scary thing? Does it take a long time? Is it difficult? Do you have to leave behind all the ambitions that you had for sort of complex chemistry that you were doing? How does that work out in practice? So maybe first thing, I, I don't think you have to leave behind all your complex ambitions, and I definitely did not do that. I, I still have all of them. Um, in terms of uh, 
like one thing that I think is a good idea is to familiar familiarize yourself with coding because even if you don't write the code yourself, you probably need to talk to somebody that writes code and they will speak a very different language than you. And if you know a little bit about what their job is, then you can make it easier for them. So it's just for the sake of being able to communicate with people from different disciplines. If you want to talk with somebody in AI, uh, like actually implementing the algorithms, that's one thing you, you, you're going to need to do. So I would, I think it's a good idea to spend some time on that. Um, can you be more precise? I mean, what do we have to learn? Do we have to learn Python or do we have to learn some other computer language or? I mean, I don't think it's, I mean, if you learn Python right now, it's probably a relatively safe bet in the sense that a lot of the AI is at least initially implemented in Python so that it will help you. And the good thing about that is Python is relatively user friendly. The, the entrance barrier is relatively low. But if, you, if it just so happens you don't want to do Python or you had to, for some reason learned another language, that's also fine. So it doesn't need to be. But yeah, I think Python is a good idea. And the other thing is, I think generally what we should think about is, is data and data representation and how data is, is stored on a computer. So um, what is, you want to make it as simple as possible for the computer use the data out of the box. So if you think of, let's say, if you have a lab notebook that's still handwritten, that's probably not what the computer will have the easiest time understanding. Sure, there are AI algorithms that can recognize handwriting, and they're actually pretty good at it. Still, <laughs> you don't, they don't want to make it difficult for the computer. So if you have an electronic lab notebook where it's actually characters that the computer can read, that makes it simpler. Uh, but like going back to what I initially said, rather than natural language, even though the computer is very good at natural language for now, as we know from ChatGPT, Still, you will make it even easier for the computer to use, let's say, um, I would say a flowchart representation, like in an algorithmic way of a chemical synthesis. So maybe pretty much how chemical engineering thinks about processes. So you have kind of a flowchart and like standardized uh, reactors, steps that represent your process. And that's actually immediately understandable for a computer. So I think think about how you s represent the data and then uh, store it. I think that's something that will help you in, in the very near future to work in this space. If you think about this a bit further, because my next question was you were talking about artificial organic chemistry. What if we think about artificial organic chemists? So that's not quite the robot lab, but maybe on route to the robot lab, because when I was talking to companies, they, they want to digitize the lab. So it's a little bit what you just said is rather than making a, a lab notebook where you have to write down everything, even if you type that in nicely, you're still going to forget half of it or think it was not relevant or think, well, I always do it this way, so I don't write it down. So you could also say, I sort of put a camera in the lab and I digitize everything that you're doing. So everything you do in the lab, we, we make it sure we have a movie. And then next person could get, go in with a virtual reality goggles and simply sort of essentially move through your movie. And so you see a big arrow saying, oh, go there. It turns out to be the balance. And there's a little arrow that says, oh, open the little sliding door. And then you look to the right and it says, weigh these compounds. We need that. And so you, you could say, well, that's not quite a robot lab because it's you doing it, but it would be a way forward to making sure that all the data is, or all the experiments are very, very, very precisely locked. So you have no problem reproducing that. Is that something that you would say, well, that is a great idea. We should be starting to think about doing chemistry in that way? I do think it's, it's a great idea. The only thing that comes to my mind right now is if- I see some people going a little bit pale now, but uh, that, we can discuss <laughs> that. So, so. One thing that I, I just re realized is obviously then if you make it really movies and store them for, let's say, eternity, I think we will have a problem with storing too much data. So in the sense, it, like I like the principal idea with the virtual reality, but there, it might be more efficient to generate this virtual reality on the fly based on a computer, let's say, very compressed procedure. 
And in that sense, I think that would then be, I think, what you would ultimately want to have. Like that there is a, let's say, maybe this, this process, like chemical engineering process workflow that the computer on the fly translate into this virtual environment that you then see uh, as an experiment. I think that yeah. that's the way to yeah. go. But I, I like the idea a lot. It's just, I think, data storage, if you really have videos of everything, will be a problem. Comments or questions about this? Yes, Dimitri. Um, but if you create like videos or virtual realities where anybody could go in, see the video, and do like replicate the whole thing, then what would well the education of chemists be like then? It would be exactly that. That's maybe how you teach the next generation of chemists because now you have to go to the teaching lab. And it takes me forever to explain to you how the balance functions or how the rotovap functions or how the mass spec functions. And now you could just say, wear the goggles and I can do something else. And you go off with your goggles and you are being taught on how to do it. Or you do it a thousand times in a virtual reality environment. I mean, Max Verstappen doesn't sort of train around the race circuit. He sits in a mock racing car. He trains at home, right? So, every year. so you could also say, I want to be really, really good in weighing my sample or something, something. So you could sit at home with your virtual reality set and weighing your sample. All the time. So when you go to the lab, you're really good at it and you can do it within a few seconds. So, something, so, so it could be that you don't use it for actual research, but for training purposes. So, and I think with a lot of things we start doing, I think some things are very simple and people can teach you very easily. But there's also a lot of other things. I mean, maybe running even a column in the lab, right? It's, there's so many things that people have little tricks or something, something. I think if you can train on how to do that in a virtual environment, it might actually sort of allow you to become much better at something, um, even though you don't have to use all the reagents. All. So maybe it's a, something for more a teaching environment. Yeah, and if I may add to that, actually, um, in medicine studies, they're already using these techniques to, to do surgeries. Um, so they do virtual surgeries, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 times before they do an actual, let's say, real life surgery. So I think you can think of it in very much the same way. I mean, sometimes doing certain, like using certain chemicals, doing some experiments, using instrumentation is quite expensive. Um, I mean, we now know that sometimes energy is also very expensive, but if we uh, can have a very efficient way of doing that, then we can, let's say, to achieve almost the same or maybe the same uh, at a much cheaper cost, and then we can replicate it as much as we want. It's safe. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, there is a, certainly a potential for that. Any other, anybody else ideas on this? It's maybe too controversial right now. <laughs> I also don't know how difficult it would be to implement it, but I think people are, thinking about it and trying yeah, to do this. We would need a lot of people for content creation, like the 3D environment, the physics. But there are a lot of people working on that, so. Evan. Yeah, well. <laughs> following the line of this discussion, I mean, to me, this seems like an intermediate step to just going to the actual robot, right? There's, there's a lab from the UK demonstrate that already, but I mean, through it, if we're talking about training a person to do a repeated job as precise as possible, can we just use a robot instead to go for a robot arm? Just Actually, I was thinking we only have 97 million for this robot lab. It might be cheaper to train a person than to train the robot. That's my opinion, but yeah. maybe Robert disagrees with me. He thinks the robot is cheaper, but I think people are cheaper. No, I, I, do, I do agree with you right, right now. <laughs> These robot arms are really quite expensive, and for now, it's probably definitely say, more effective to train uh, human experts on this than training a robot arm to be an expert on it. But I don't know, maybe in 20, 30 years, it might be a very different situation. I don't know. I think the big difference is if you want to use the robot lab for the same thing every day, year in, year out, then you will do it completely self driving. But if you think about a lab, Every day you're doing something slightly different, right? You never do exactly the same, well, at least once, because you need to duplicate your results. But 
typically, you do something different every day. Every time you decide, ah, now I should try this, now I should try that. So for research, I think it is much better to have a person. Because the robot, you train the robot with great cost, and then next week you decide that the robot should do something different. You have to retrain. And even if that goes faster and faster, I think it means that you have to reconfigure things. I think the self-driving lab will be for sort of maybe things that are more routine and sort yeah. of need to be repeated many, many times, extremely precisely generating large data sets. And especially, as Robert said earlier, where you want to increment the sort of temperature in your reaction one degree at a time, right? You don't want to do that as a person. You're very bored. But then the robot will do that much. That's my guess. Final question, because we're reaching 9 o'clock. If not, yes, there is a final question over there. Uh, hi. So you mentioned uh, AlphaFold in your presentation. And I was wondering if uh, it's used in the pipeline. So for example, I imagine like estimating how the molecule reacts is very, very difficult. So knowing its 3D properties is probably very helpful in that regard. So do you use AlphaFold in some point in your algorithm? So what you need to understand about AlphaFold is that it only works for amino acid sequences and it's only reliable starting from a certain number of amino acids where you have, let's say, some secondary, well-defined secondary structure elements. So um, for the tasks that we had, we, 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 we let uh, the algorithm design, let's say, general organic molecules. We cannot use AlphaFold. But what would be ideal, and actually several people are working on this, and there are, I think, already some example of this is, let's say, an analog of AlphaFold, but for any structure. So it generates you, let's say, uh, the most uh, energetically favorable 3D confirmations of any organic structure. So yes, if that uh, is uh, something that becomes reliable, we would use it. Right now, what we have is we include the conformational exploration in the, in the simulation component of our benchmarks. Uh, but if that's not necessary anymore because we can replace it with an AI, yeah, we are very happy to do that. And yeah, many people are working on this, so it's a great idea. But the yeah, AlphaFold itself cannot be used out of the box on this problem. You can only use it for amino acid sequences, which is great, but yeah, if you don't want to do amino acid sequences, you cannot use it. Okay, that's unfortunately all we have time for today. Um, exciting times. I think lots of things are happening. Thank you very much for your questions and your participation. Uh, also for those of you watching online, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. I think we're over 1,000 subscribers, so keep it going. Uh, and then I hope to see you all back uh, next month. Connor Coley from MIT, uh, he will be presenting on 11th of April, 8 o'clock. Thank you very much.